أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the universe And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of his prophets and messengers Including his final and beloved messenger, the seal of the prophets, Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and his purified family and righteous companions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ God desires to be gracious to those who were oppressed in the land and to make them imams and to make them the heirs, Amanna Billah, Sadaqallahu Al-Aliyu Al-Azim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The eighth of Rabi'u Thani, the month of Rabi'u Thani, marks the anniversary of the birth of the eleventh Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari, alayhi salam. And our traditions tell us that the 11th Imam was born in the city of Medina in the year 231 or more, or more, more likely 232 after Hijrah. And that, of course, we know his father is the 10th Imam, Al-Imam Ali al-Hadi alayhi salam. And the tradition tells us that the mother of the 11th Imam is a woman by the name of Hudith or Susan. The traditions tell us that she was actually Nubian, meaning that she originated from the area which covers the southern part of Egypt or the northern part of Sudan in present day Africa, the mother of the 11th Imam. So the Imam was born in the city of Medina and when he was about four years old, his father, the 10th Imam, along with his family, including the 11th Imam himself, they were summoned by the Abbasid Caliph from Medina all the way to Samarra in the northern part of Iraq. This is where there was an established garrison town. Samarra was a garrison town. It was established by the Abbasids at the time. And so the Imam along with his family, the 10th Imam along with his family, including the 11th Imam, they were summoned. They had to leave the city of Medina, the city of their residence, the city of their family, the city of their grandfather, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, to go to the city of Samarra in northern Iraq. And the Imam himself was four years old at the time. And as a result, we find that he, along with his father, the 10th Imam, they both had acquired the title of Al-Askari. Al-Askari is from Askar. Askar in Arabic means fort. It has to do with the military, and this is because Samarra was a garrison town. It was a military fort at the time, a military town. And because the Imam and his family were stationed in that town, they had adopted the title of Al Askari. And traditions, they tell us that the Imam, the 11th Imam, he had many titles. Among the most prominent of his titles was Ibn al Ridha. The son of Ar Ridha, although the 11th Imam is the great grandson of the 8th Imam, Al Imam Ali and Ar Ridha salam, is the 8th Imam, Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari is the great grandson of the 8th Imam, yet one of his famous titles was Ibn Ar Ridha, and traditions tell us not just him, but his father, the 10th Imam, was also referred to as Ibn Ar Ridha. And his grandfather, the ninth Imam, who was the son of the 8th Imam, he was also known as Ibn al Ridha. So the ninth, 10th, and 11th Imams, they were all known as Ibn al Ridha. And this tells us that the, it shows us the position of the 8th Imam, Al Imam Ali al Ridha. How 
well known he was, how highly recognized he was in society, that even up to his great grandson would be called Ibn al Rida. Of course, besides being a member of the family of Ahlul Bayt and being an Imam of Ahlul Bayt and having his own personal status of knowledge and taqwa and righteousness and all of these things, we know that the eighth Imam, he was appointed as the successor to the Khilafah by the Abbasid Caliph Al Ma'mun. Al Ma'mun, during his time, he had appointed Al Imam Al Rada alayhi salam as his successor, the successor to the Khilafah. But traditions, they tell us that once he realized how much the Imam began to acquire prominence, people began to turn to him. Of course, he was already from the Ahlul Bayt, from Bani Hashim. He was very well known. But because he was given this position, there was even more exposure to the general society. More people recognized him and he began to acquire more prominence amongst the masses. Historians tell us that when Al Ma'mun and the rest of the Abbasids, they recognized this, they ended up taking care of the Imam, poisoning the Imam, so as to take him out of the picture once again. At any rate, the Imam alayhi salam, this, the 11th Imam, he had acquired several titles and he was known for his righteousness. He was known for his knowledge. He was known for his forbearance, for his kindness, for having all of the great qualities and virtues of a pious person, of a leader. Of course, within the line of just like his fathers, his forefathers and his, uh, uh, his ancestors, all the way going back to the Holy Prophet. All of them, they were known for their righteousness, for their piety, for their goodness towards others, for their taqwa, their recognition of God and their goodness towards the creation. They were all known. So at the age of four, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he moves with his father to Samarra, and he continues living in Samarra until the year 254, when the Imam is 22 years old. In the year 254 after Hijrah, his father, the 10th Imam, Al Imam Al Hadi, alayhi salam, he passes away. And so at this age, at the age of 22, the Imam is transferred from his father, the 10th Imam, to the 11th Imam. The 11th Imam assumes leadership of the community, the Imamah, the responsibilities of the Imamah, at the age of 22 years old. And historians, they tell us that despite his young age, he was very knowledgeable, he was very wise. Even, not just his friends and followers recognize this, but even his enemies, historians tell us that some of his greatest enemies, they had recognized his piety, his wisdom, his insights, his goodness. That he was someone that was well recognized in society. And so he assumed the imama at the age of 22 and he ended up living in Samarra, remaining in Samarra until his death in the year 260, when he was only 28 years old. According to some traditions, they tell us that the Imam, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he was poisoned. And it's not far, because he was only 28 years old. He was only 28 years old. Yes, at that time, the lifespan, the life expectancy of people was not too long. But usually people would not die that early. They would remain until their 50s and their 60s, around that time. If you look at the historical, if you read the historical documents, many of the people at that time, they would live until, until their 50s and their 60s, if not above. Some of them, even they would reach their 90s. Some of them, at that time, they lived longer than some of us do during this time. And so it is not far that the Imam, it, it's not far assumption and there is some evidence, some traditional evidence that the Imam himself was also poisoned and died at the age of 28 years old in Samarra. And he was buried alongside his father, Al-Imam 
Al-Hadi alayhi salam in Samarra. And some of you may have gone and have visited the shrine, the burial place of the two Imams, the 10th and the 11th Imams in Samarra. When we study the life of the 11th Imam, we find that he lived during a, an era of sustained repression and difficulty for the members of the Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, the descendants of the Prophet, and especially the descendants of Imam Ali alayhi salam, the Alawis. They were known as the Alawis or the Talibis. They were the victims of a campaign, a sustained campaign of repression. They witnessed many difficulties during that era. Historians tell us that the 11th Imam, he lived during the reign of eight Abbasid Caliphs. Eight Abbasid Caliphs from the, the day within the span of 28 years of his life, he witnessed eight Abbasid Caliphs. They are, according to the historians, they are number one, Al-Mu'tasim, Al-Abbasi, number two, Al-Wathiq, number three, Al-Mutawakkil, and Al-Mutawakkil, you know, all of these Abbasid Caliphs, and we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit more, but all of these Abbasid Caliphs, they were known for their animosity towards the Ahlul Bayt. Although, when they began their campaign to take over and overthrow the Umayyads and come into power, they did so under the facade, under the face of what? Of bringing the strength and power back to the family of the Holy Prophet. Right? And they are the descendants of Al-Abbas, so they are from the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, from his uncle. Yet, as soon as they were able to acquire power, they turned. They turned against the household of the Holy Prophet. And they repressed them. And Mutawakkil is known, according to historians, to have several times to have gone and attacked the tomb, the shrine of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala, destroying the shrine because he tried to avert the pilgrims from going to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And so, in order to stop them, in order to stop the pilgrims from recognizing Imam Hussein alayhi salam, who is the grandson? Who is Imam Hussein? Imam Hussein is the grandson of the Holy Prophet. He's not some outsider. He's not some foreigner that came and he imposed himself on the Muslims or on the Muslim community. He's the grandson of the Holy Prophet. And the pilgrims, those who go and visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, they do so for the sake and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do so so as to bring happiness and peace to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and to the family, to his daughter Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And so Al-Mutawakkil was known to have destroyed the tomb of Imam Hussein so as to try to stop the pilgrims from going and performing the ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, you know, we plan and Allah plans. We attempt to put out the light of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَيَأْبَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا أَن يُتِمَّ نُورَهِ God has a plan to allow His light and His representatives to remain shining even as much as we try to put an end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sustains their recognition and their remembrance and their position so this was Al-Mutawakkil the third Abbasid Caliph that the Imam lived during his reign. The fourth was Al-Muntasir. The fifth was Al-Musta'een. And then the sixth was Al-Mu'taz. The seventh was Al-Muhtadi. And the seventh uh, and the eighth was Al-Mu'tamad. And the, these last three, Al-Mu'taz, Al-Muhtadi, and Al-Mu'tamad, they were the Caliphs during the period of the Imama of the 11th Imam. Once he became the Imam in the year 252, at the age of 22, he experienced during the rest of the four, uh, uh, six years of his life, the six years of his Imamah, 
he lived during the reign of these last three Abbasid caliphs. And they were known. The Abbasid caliphs, as I mentioned, they were known for their animosity towards the Ahlul Bayt. And especially towards the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Not just the Imams, but also their followers. The Shia lived during very difficult times during the time of the Abbasids. Historians tell us that the 11th Imam, for most of his life, he lived under house arrest or imprisonment. And this was in fact the reason why he and his family were summoned from Medina to Samarra. So that the Caliph can place a closer eye on them. Can make sure that they are not able to gain popularity and prominence. And so he lived most of his life under house arrest. Some parts of his life, in fact, not just house arrest, but even imprisonment in the prisons of the Abbasid Caliphs. And there was close surveillance of him and his family. Oftentimes the Abbasids, they would send agents to infiltrate the close circles of the Imams to listen, to see what are they saying? What are they talking about? Are they trying to plan something, a revolution or a revolt? Even when the Imam, according to some traditions, even when the Imam was in prison, he was imprisoned in the dungeons and in the jail cell, there were still some spies sent to him to see what he and his companions and his followers would say. Often the Abbasids, they would send agents to enter into the home of the Imam to search his home. They would raid his home. We are told time and time again, his father, the 10th Imam, Al-Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam, sometimes they would enter his home in the middle of the night when he and his family were at their house in the privacy of their home. They were asleep, they were resting. The agents, they would enter into the home of the Imam and they would begin to search, they would raid the home, they would search everywhere in the home, looking for weapons, looking for money, looking for other things. And sometimes the traditions tell us that the Imams would be dragged out of the home at night in their clothes, in their clothing that they wear at home, the privacy of their home, in those clothing, they would not even allow them to change their clothes they would take them, they would pull them out of their homes and they would be taken towards the caliph, sometimes they would be imprisoned. This was the life that the imams lived. For most of his life, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he lived in such a situation and as I mentioned, not just him, but his followers as well. Traditions tell us that many of the followers and the close companions of the imams, they used to be imprisoned alongside the imams in the jails. They spent most of their time, most of their lives in prison. Historians tell us that many of the family members of the Holy Prophet, besides the Imams themselves, the extended family members, many of them were tortured, some of them were killed just for being the descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The historians, they paint a gruesome picture of some of the torment and the torture that the followers and the family members of the Ahlul Bayt they faced. Very difficult depictions. When we read this history, very difficult to read this history. Some atrocious acts. You know, sometimes in the news, unfortunately, we hear of terrorism, terrorist acts, people going into mosques and buildings and blowing themselves up and, and doing all sorts of, of, you know, uh, harmful things, atrocious acts, burning people alive, and we are astonished. We ask ourselves, how is this possible that a human being, someone who has a conscience, supposedly has a conscience, can engage in such behavior, can hurt other people, can torture other people. We hear about, you know, reports of government officials torturing people, torturing them, right? And we think to ourselves, how is it possible that this, is, this happens? But this is not the first time, and it's not the last time. Read history and you will hear reports of people 
who according to historians, the Abbasids, they would take some of the Talibis, the descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Bani Hashim, the family of the Prophet, they would take them and they would bury them alive in the pillars of buildings. When they would build buildings, they would bury them alive inside the pillars. This was one tactic, let alone the rest of the torture tactics, the poisoning and the killing of the Imams themselves. And this is why I, I mentioned it's not far-fetched, brothers and sisters. Some people, they try to dismiss. They say, oh no, the Shia, they're you know, overdramatic. They consider all of their Imams to have been killed or poisoned. This is problematic. We don't know. Some of them may have died under normal circumstances. It's not necessary that they were all poisoned. Read the history. If they were ready to do all of these things to regular family members of the, the Prophet and to their followers, what about the Imams themselves? When they would raid their homes in the middle of the night, the historians tell us that Al Imam Al Askari alayhi salam, they would enter into his home and they would not only raid his home, but they would even search the women in the house to see whether they were pregnant or not. To see whether they were pregnant or not. Why? Because they want to keep an eye out. They know this is the family of Rasulullah. They know the truth. They have heard the traditions from the Prophet himself about his successors and their number and their names. And this was not the first time. The Quran tells us that the same tactic was used by Fir'aun during the time of Musa alayhi salam, right? Fir'aun, his advisors, they also told him. They told him there will come a man who will put an end to you. And so what did he end up doing? He went and he arrested. He raided the homes of all of the people. And every time there was a newborn boy, this newborn boy would be killed. Until what? Until the time of Musa alayhi salam himself. The Quran tells us very clearly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he protected Musa alayhi salam. Although this campaign was going on, Musa alayhi salam was protected in the beautiful story that the Quran tells us about until Musa arrived in the home, in the home and in the hands of Fir'aun himself, but Fir'aun could not put an end to him. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. But this is the environment, these are the circumstances that the Imams lived in. Historians tell us that the Imam had very limited access to his followers and to the general public. That sometimes the Imam would tell his companions that if you see me outside in public, do not recognize me, do not express recognition of me to the point where I do not expect you, I do not want you to even say salam to me. Because this was the type of environment that they lived in. Where the Imam could not openly communicate with his followers. The followers were not able to openly and freely communicate with their leader. The Imam tells one of his companions that if you hear someone who is cursing us. This was one of the tactics they would do in public. They would curse the Imams and they would see people's reactions. How do you react? If you stood up and you said something and you stopped, you would be punished because this would express what? Your loyalty to the Imams. So the Imam, he tells his companions, he says, if you're out in public and you hear someone cursing us, debasing us, do not say anything, remain silent. Why? Because we fear for your lives. Because your lives will be in danger. For standing up, for saying something, for expressing your loyalty and love to the Imams. This was reality, brothers. This is history. This is history. This is what the Imams, they experienced. And thus we find that the Imam lived in a period of great difficulty, of repression. This repression was sustained over generations and generations. Sometimes we criticize and we read about the heinous acts of the Umayyads and they are criticized and rightfully so for their atrocities. But when we come and read the history of the Abbasids, and by the way, 
Some of this history is considered by the general public. We see this within the general Muslim community. We see this even in the academic community. If we read about this history, the history of the Abbasids, it's considered the golden era of Islam, the golden era. Why? Because of the developments in, you know, in, in art, in, in literature, in, in, in the sciences, all of these things. Yes, this is all great. All of these things developed during the time of the Abbasids. But on the other hand, what kind of society did they live in? A repressed society where people would be tortured and killed because of what? Because of their love and affection towards whom? Towards whom? Outsiders? Towards the family of Rasulullah. Towards the descendants of the Holy Prophet, the Prophet of Islam. The Prophet of the message. The one who brought the message forth. And so we find that the Imam lived during this very difficult time. Some historians, they point out that the Imam had a brother by the name of Ja'far. Ja'far, according to the historians, Ja'far is a controversial figure. Because on the one hand, some historians say that Ja'far attempted to assume the Imama after the death of his brother, Al-Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam, at his death, Ja'far, his brother, attempted to assume the Imamah. He claimed the Imam for himself, that he is the next Imam. And some historians say that Ja'far, not only did he do this, but he engaged in all types of vices, immoral behavior. Some historians say that he would drink, that he would gamble, that he would engage in other vices. Right? This is... The historians, they say that this was the brother of Al-Imam Al-Hasan al-Askari. So the son of Al-Imam al-Hadi, one of his sons, by the name of Ja'far. On the other hand, and as, as a result, some traditions, they call him Ja'far al-Kadhab, Ja'far the liar. Because he had called people to the Imamah, to himself. He had assumed the Imamah himself. Other scholars, they have questioned these traditions. They have said no. They have rejected these traditions. They have said these traditions that claim that Ja'far was an immoral person, that he engaged in immoral behavior, that he assumed the imama for himself, that this was part of the propaganda of the Abbasids. The Abbasids wanted to show that not all of the family members of the Prophet were good. Some of them were bad. So as to take away from the prominence and the purity of the Ahlul Bayt. And so some scholars, they argue this was Abbasid propaganda. Just as, the Abba, just as the Umayyads before, they had engaged in propaganda claiming that Imam Ali alayhi salam, he did not pray. This is there in history. This is there in history. That the Umayyads, they had instituted, by the way, they had instituted a mandatory cursing of Imam Ali for almost 100 years. Almost 100 years, the Khatib would curse Amir al Mu'mini. Imagine, imagine. Entire generations of people, every week when they attend the masjid to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would hear, hear the Khatib curse Amir al Mu'mini, Imam Ali. And so they had put out propaganda that Imam Ali did not pray, Allahu Akbar. The one who was born and the house of Allah, in the Kaaba, the house of Allah. And the one who died in the house of Allah did not pray. This was part of the, and people believe this because it was propaganda. It's just like today. Just like today you have a large segment of society that believes anything they see or hear on the news. Whether it's true or not, it does not matter. As long as they see it from a specific channel, this specific channel is broadcasting this news, that means it's correct. Halas, it's truth. It's inspired Jibra'il alayhi salam has come down with it. It's the truth. They believe it. And so the Abbasids, they may have also instituted this propaganda in order to take away from the position of the Ahlul Bayt and their purity. So some scholars have argued that this was all propaganda and that even if we assume that Ja'far, he had claimed the Imama to himself, some of these scholars, they interpret this as being in fact a position of loyalty to the 12th Imam. So as to divert negative attention from the Abbasids away from the 12th Imam towards himself in order to protect the 12th Imam. At any rate, 
at any rate. It's very difficult to tell because we have numerous traditions and differences of opinion. At any rate, whether Ja'far was loyal to the Imam and he was trying to attempt and he was a pious person or whether, God forbid, he had betrayed the Imam, both of these scenarios tell us that the time for the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams and their followers were, was a very difficult time. This was abnormal. Because had Ja'far betrayed the Imam, this tells us that some of his closest family members, they turned against him. Some of his closest family members. And had, in fact, Ja'far protected the Imam and had done all of this in order to protect the 12th Imam, this tells us the severity of the situation that one of the family members has to go out and deceive the people, claim the Imamah so that the 12th Imam would be protected so that he can live. Either way, it shows us how dire the situation was for the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt at that time. And so the era was won during that time. The era was won generally. When we read the history, we find that during the, the life of the 11th Imam and the 10th Imam, we find that there was a slow, gradual preparation for the inevitable ghaibah of the 12th Imam. That the Imams themselves, they had limited access to the people or the people had limited access to the Imams. This tells us that the Imams themselves were also preparing the community slowly for the inevitable time that their Imam would, they would not have direct access or access at all to their final Imam, the 12th Imam. A slow, gradual preparation for the inevitable ghaibah of the 12th Imam. We find that the Imams themselves, they appointed several representatives. Because they had limited access to the public, they had appointed several representatives, several trustworthy people in order to disseminate their message to the masses in different areas and to also protect and help guide the community. And every step of this process was a slow preparation for the ghaybah. The story of the marriage, Al-Imam Al-Askari's marriage to Narjis, the mother of the 12th Imam, is one that some of us may have heard also. Very beautiful story how detailed the 10th Imam alayhi salam, it was during his life that he in fact proceeded to prepare for the birth of the 12th Imam. Looking forward in preparation for this final Imam and Savior of mankind. And the story is very beautiful. It tells us the story of Narjis, who was a Roman princess, a Byzantine princess. And one of the descendants, according to the traditions, Narjis was one of the descendants of Saint Peter, who was one of the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. Simon, Peter, also known as Peter, was one of the disciples, one of the Hawareen, one of the helpers, the 12 helpers of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Tradition tells us that Narjis was the descendant of Peter. And as such, she was picked specifically. The tradition is long. It tells us of a dream that Narjis alayhi salam had, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, along with his family members, they approached her great-grandfather and Isa alayhi salam was also there to ask for her hand in marriage. And this, the tradition is long until she arrived to the home of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam and she married him and they gave birth to the 12th Imam. And so this was a very difficult time. Yet despite these difficulties, brothers and sisters, when we read the history and the life about the life of the Imam, we find that despite all of these difficulties, the Imam never for one day disengaged from his responsibility to guide and to help the community. That the Imam, despite the limited access that he had to the masses and to the public, that he would continue to guide, he would continue to defend the faith, he would continue to defend the Quran, Tradition tells us that the Imam alayhi salam, 
he was the author of a tafsir known as Tafsir al Imam al Askari. Of course, scholars have debated the authenticity of this tafsir, but yet the traditions are there. That the Imam, السلام, many of his traditions, he would focus on clearing up misconceptions about the Quran, teaching people about the true meaning of the Quran. And that the Imam often wrote to his followers. Again, because he had limited access, unlike other Imams who had a lot of access to their community, the fifth and the sixth Imams, they would teach hundreds if not thousands of people publicly. They were able to do so. But Imam al-Askari he had limited access to the masses. So in many cases, he would end up writing letters and sending them with representatives to various areas in the Muslim world at the time so that he can continue maintain his communication towards his followers, towards the believers. And many of the traditions, they tell us some of the beautiful advice that he would give. There is a beautiful book, a work that has been compiled. It is called Musnad al-Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. It's been written by a scholar who passed away a few years ago, I think, I believe in 2014, Sheikh Azizullah al Utaridi. He compiled all of the traditions that he could, all of the traditions in the major sources that we have relating to the life and the times and the legacy and the history of Al Imam al Askari. He put them all together, he compiled them all together in one volume. And he called it Musnad al-Imam al-Askari It's written in Arabic. I don't know if it's been translated. But it's a very beautiful work where he gives the history of the Imam, the life and times of the Imam. And also he relates the number of those who directly they related traditions from the Imam salam, Whether they were his followers, those who followed him and believed in him, or some even some of his enemies but they still narrated traditions directly from, from the Imam. He names, I believe, about 150 individuals. And part of this work is dedicated to the various letters and the sermons and the sayings of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. And I'd like to just share a couple, just a couple. I know we don't have too much time, but just a couple so that we may be blessed, inshallah, with the guidance of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. He says in... One tradition, in one tradition, he says, إِنَّكُمْ فِي آجَالٍ مَنْقُوصَةٍ You are approaching your fate very quickly. إِنَّكُمْ فِي آجَالٍ مَنْقُوصَةٍ Each one of us has a fate, and this fate is slowly coming closer and closer to us. إِنَّكُمْ فِي آجَالٍ مَنْقُوصَةٍ وَأَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَةٍ You have a limited number of days. All of us. We all have a limited number of days. And death comes quickly and without announcement. Suddenly. Death does not come and knock on our doors and seek permission from us. Death, when it comes, it comes. Then he says, مَنْ يَزْرَعْ خَيْرًا يَحْصُدْ غِبْطَ And whoever plants goodness, righteousness, will reap facility. During this limited time that you have, whatever you plant, the seeds that you plant, the type of seeds that you plant, you will reap their produce. When you reap, when you sow something good, you will reap the beneficial produce of it. يَحْصُدْ غِبْطَةٍ وَمَنْ يَزْرَعْ شَرًّا يَحْصُدْ نَدَامًا And whoever sows, plants, evil, immorality, will reap what? Will reap regret. It's either felicity or regret. We decide. We decide what we want to plant and we decide what we want to reap. Then he says, that on that day of on the day of judgment, on the day of accountability, the day in which we reap our produce and our actions, there is no room for fortune or luck. 
On that day, we can't expect any luck. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I have not planted anything good. Suddenly, I see a beautiful tree. No, it's not going to happen. If you have not planted this beautiful tree, then you will not reap anything, any good produce. There is no room for luck. Everyone is held accountable based on his or her actions. In another tradition, he says, he says, Husnu surati jamalun dahir. This is quite relevant, I think, even for our times. He says, physical beauty, physical appearance is an outer beauty. Many times we talk about outer beauty and inner beauty, right? He says, physical appearance is an outer beauty. Whereas the inner beauty is what? Is وحسن العقل. وحسن العقل جمال الب... جمال الباطن. The beauty of intellect is the inner beauty. And this is a reminder to us brothers and sisters. Because many times we end up focusing on our outer appearance, on our outer beauty. We spend time, we spend money, we spend effort making sure that our outer appearance is perfect, is immaculate. Most people, huh? Some people, they don't care. But most people. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. Our tradition tells us, encourages us to look presentable, to take care of our appearance. The famous tradition says, Allahu jamilun yuhibbul jamal. God is beauty and God loves that which is beautiful. And we are encouraged to look presentable, to look beautiful. The problem is when it becomes an obsession. When our outer appearance becomes the objective, the goal. The goal. Whereas we do not put any consideration, time or effort in taking care of our inner beauty, our intellect, our soul. And most, if not all of our effort is on taking care of our outer appearance. This is problematic. This is problematic. Why? Because the outer appearance, no matter how great it is, no matter how much time and money and effort you spend on looking beautiful on the outside, making sure that your hair looks nice, your face looks nice, your clothing, your attire, everything is good, there will come a time where this outer beauty will fade. No amount of makeup, no amount of surgeries, nothing will help. There will come a time where khalas, it's gone. It's past, right? But the inner beauty, the beauty of the soul, the beauty of the heart, the beauty of the mind remains. The beauty of the mind remains. It remains. And this is why it's important for us, and I remind myself before I remind you, brothers and sisters, that while we take care of our outer appearance, let us not forget the inner beauty, our inner appearance. Our inner beauty, that of our intellect that of our heart, our mind, our soul. Let us make sure that not only is our hair immaculate, some people, they are obsessed with their hair. If one hair is not you know, straight, that's a problem, خلاص. it's a bad hair day for them. They consider it a bad hair day. But they have no qualms, no problem when their heart is not perfect, when their mind is not perfect, if they are disrespectful towards others. Their hair has to be perfect. But if their mind is not perfect or their heart is not perfect, no problem. خلاص. We have to make sure that we take care of our inner beauty as we do our outer beauty. In another tradition, he says, He says, all vices, all immorality, خبائث, all of them, they are placed in a room and the key to this room, they are locked. All of these moral vices, immoralities, they are locked in a room. The key to these immoralities, to the door, is what? Is deceit, is lying. Meaning that lying does what? It opens the door to all of these other immoralities, to all of these other vices. This is something that is very important for us brothers and sisters to consider. It's sort of like the idea of a gateway drug. 
Sometimes, you know, they speak about gateway drugs. They say there are some drugs out there, they are considered gateway drugs. What does this mean? This means that these drugs, while they may not necessarily be the most harmful in terms of their effect on us, what do they do? They open the door to trying to consume and acquire other more harmful drugs, right? It's the same with lying. Lying, we may consider it to be minor. We may dismiss lying. We may say it's just a small lie. Well, we've developed a word for it too, a phrase. We say white lie to make it sound like it's good, right? We may say this is, it's a small lie, khalas. It's okay. If I lie to my parents, this small lie, nothing's going to happen. No one's going to get hurt. If I lie to my spouse, my friend, if I lie to my customer, if I lie to my boss, if I lie to this stranger, no problem. It's just one small lie. No one's going to get hurt. But the problem is that this one lie will pull another lie, a second lie, and a third lie, and a fourth lie. And God forbid it opens the door to all types of immorality. Where's the limit? Where do we draw a line? This line that we draw becomes arbitrary. Thus the Imam says, keep the door locked. Do not allow, do not use the key to all immorality and vices. Do not engage in lying. Avoid lying. And finally, in a beautiful uh, uh, advice that is mentioned in the traditions, the Imam wrote to his Shia perhaps towards the end of his life. He wrote this will towards his followers and to the Shia. He, see, he says, أُوصِيكُمْ بِتَقْوَ Allah." I encourage you to have consciousness of God, to be God conscious. وَالْوَرَعْ فِي دِينِكُمْ And to be observant of your commands, your religious commands. وَالْإِجْتِهَادْ لِلَّهِ To put all of your effort Exert all of your effort for the sake of Allah. وَصِدْقِ hadith. Once again, he says, and always be truthful when you speak. وَصِدْقِ hadith. وَأَدَاءِ الْأَمَانَةِ إِلَىٰ مَنْ اِئْتَمَنَكُمْ And to fulfill trust to those who entrusted you. مِنْ بِرٍ أَوْ فَاجِرٍ Doesn't matter who it is. This person, it could be good, bad, evil, immoral, righteous. If they entrust you, you should fulfill the trust. If you promise them something, fulfill the promise. If they entrust you with a secret, you fulfill that. You protect it. It doesn't matter who they are. Birrin aw fajr. And then he says, watul as sujood. Lengthen, prolong your sujood. Sometimes we try to do our sujood quickly, as quick as possible, so that we can get on with our business, so that I can go and have lunch, so that I can go to bed so that I can go and watch TV, whatever it may be. Quickly, quickly, right? Play video games, go on WhatsApp, go on Facebook, huh? Quickly, I wanna pray quickly. The Imam says, no, take time, take time. Lengthen, prolong your sujood. Spend more time placing your forehead on the dust in recognition and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith is well known, we've all heard it, that the Imam says that as long as a person, if one person who prostrates, the person who prostrates does sujood, if he or she knew how much rewards and virtue they were receiving during their moment of sujood, they would never raise their head from sujood. Watul al sujood, the Imam says, wa husnul jiwar. And be good neighbors. Be good neighbors. وَحُسْنُ الْجِوَارِ And then he says, فَبِهَذَا جَاءَ مُحَمَّدٍ The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came with these advice. This advice is not something new. The Imam says, this advice is exactly what my great-grandfather, the Holy Prophet, brought forth. This is why he came forth, to teach us all of these things. And then he says, فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلْ مِنْكُمْ إِذَا وَرَعَ فِي دِينَهِ وَصَدَقَ فِي حَدِيثِهِ وَأَدَّ الْأَمَانَةِ وَحَسُنَ خُلَقُهُ مَعَ النَّاسِ If the person does all of these things, he or she is pious, cognizant of God, they have good manners with people, they do all of the things that they're supposed to do, قِيلَ هَذَا شِعِي 
when people will look towards him or her, they will recognize, they will say, this person is a Shi'i. He, he or she is a follower of the Imams. They will recognize a person's position through what? Through their actions. Not through claims. We can all go out and say, I am Shi'i, I am follower of the Ahlul Bayt, I love the Ahlul Bayt. Many people do. Many people. In fact, Muslims, all Muslims, if you go and you ask them, do you love the Ahlul Bayt? They say, we love the Ahlul Bayt. Even if you ask non-Muslims, some people who do not even subscribe to Islam, you tell them, do you love the Ahlul Bayt? If they've read about the Ahlul Bayt, they say, we love the Ahlul Bayt. No one says we hate. Some people, they may hate the Ahlul Bayt, but no one comes out and admits and says, I hate the Ahlul Bayt. I cannot tolerate the Ahlul Bayt. Even their enemies, the Abbasids themselves, they would never admit. They would always say that we love the Ahlul Bayt. Huh? Claims can be made by everyone. What distinguishes a true follower of the Ahlul Bayt and someone who hates the Ahlul Bayt but claims they love the Ahlul Bayt. What distinguishes them? If they are both making the same claim, what distinguishes them is their actions. Do they follow the Ahlul Bayt or do they not? Is their life and the way that they live their life, does it conform to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt or not? When someone sees, they will say, yes, this is a true Shia. This is a true follower of the Ahlul Bayt. And then he says, فَيُسِرُّنِي ذَلِكِ And this makes me happy. This makes the Imam happy. This makes the Ahlul Bayt happy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to make us and give us the capacity to be among the genuine followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the honor and the privilege of performing the ziyarah the visitation of Imam al-Askari and the rest of the Imams and their grandfather Rasulullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us this honor in this life to perform their ziyarah and to receive their shafa'ah, their intercession in the hereafter. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to honor us with witnessing the appearance of our 12th Imam al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Mahdi ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his peace and blessings upon those who are sick, those who are ill, those who are suffering around the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring them relief and comfort. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the souls of those who have passed away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to allow us as we end this year and to start the new year, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us, to forgive us for our faults, our misdeeds, and to bless us with greater piety, taqwa, righteousness, and success in the upcoming days and months and years. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the souls of those who have passed away. Uh, I just remind you, brothers and sisters, of course, tomorrow we have Salatul Jumu'ah at 12 o'clock. From 12 to 1 o'clock, we will be having Salatul Jumu'ah, insha'Allah. وَإِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ نُهْدِي جَمِيعًا ثَوَابَ سُورَةِ الْفَاتِحَ مَعَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِي مُحَمَّدٍ